Hey everybody, Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com, here for episode number 233 of Goulet Q&A, and it's kind of a special one. So normally I just kind of answer random questions all over the place, but today there's somewhat of a theme, um, because tomorrow, on Saturday, we're celebrating the ninth anniversary of what we consider to be the anniversary of the Goulet Pen Company. Technically on the books, it's not our anniversary, but it is the anniversary of when we received our first shipment of fountain pen goods, which really is what spurred Goulet pens in its modern form. So that was November 17th, 2009. And uh, it's been nine years since that happened, which is kind of crazy, um, especially because I have a son who's almost nine years old. So like as I'm watching him grow up, I'm seeing our business grow up too. And it's really kind of crazy. But anyway, so it's very nostalgic time for Rachel and I because we're just hitting on our own 17th anniversary of when we met, which is just crazy. Um, but, uh, you know, we have a, a new member of our team here. His name is John, and he's actually sitting right over here <laughs> off camera. So he's our new director of marketing, and we're very excited. John's getting the full experience of what it's like to be here. It's his first week here, and he's going to sit in on a QA and a and kind of watch how the magic happens here. So he's going to get to get, you're going to get a lot of good business background experience in this Q&A as well. So maybe some interesting things um, that you can gain from it. So um, that's kind of cool. And then I also wanted to mention that we are halfway through our thanks giveaway initiative that we have going on and want to make sure that you knew about it if you haven't seen it in our newsletter or on our blog. Um, the spirit of thanks giveaway is something that we've done because a lot of retailers, especially this time of year, if you happen to be on social media or receive emails on a regular basis, you know that this is a very popular time of year for retailers to be like, hey, buy this, buy this, buy this. And uh, we do plenty of that too, because that's how we keep our doors open. But we also like to try to give back and promote just, you know, this time of Thanksgiving, um, which is what this time of year is, is about a little bit here. So um, we like to in encourage the expression of gratitude through handwritten letters. And it's something kind of cool we've been promoting over the last several years. Um, and we're doing some of that this year too. So um, all you have to do to participate in our contest is to um, write a letter to, you know, a letter of gratitude, because express gratitude is one of our values, um, to someone that you're thankful for and share it with us uh, to be entered into the contest. So you can see all the details and proper hashtags and stuff like that to use on our blog, um, and we'll link to it down in the bio below. Um, but you can win a $150 gift certificate to our store, which is pretty rad, or a sweet Visconti Homo Sapiens prize pack, which that's a holy grail pen for a lot of you out there, and I know that's pretty exciting. So, hey, you know, the prize stuff is all well and good, but honestly, the real prize is getting to express your gratitude to somebody that could really appreciate it. So that's what this is all about. So leave us a comment below if you have any questions about that, but you can check out the blog for more details. So um, we're not going to have a very heavy product theme Q&A today because I had a lot of business -y kind of questions, um, but we, we do have a lot going on in the world of uh, pen stuff. So... I'm gonna talk about that, and then once we get into the questions, I'll shift gears a little bit. So, um, so many new products happening right now. The rickshaw pen cases that we came up as an exclusive, excuse me, we launched those this week. They're selling well, very happy. Mark over at Rickshaw is very happy, and we're, we're just excited to finally have these after having developed them for the last couple of months. So you can check those out on our site. We got a few different options for you, and if you've been watching Q&A, you're familiar with them. So I won't, I won't uh, explain that again, but uh, another thing that we launched this week, is, week was a Pilot Explorer. So the Explorer, I talked about it with Colin and Q&A on Wednesday. Uh, we talked about it a little bit, and uh, it's essentially like a plastic version of a Metropolitan. So if you want a Metropolitan, like the way that it writes, but you want a lighter pen, um, this might be a really good option for you. Maybe something a little longer, snap cap, doesn't have a really you know, big step or anything like that, but same exact same nib as what's on the Metropolitan. So really good pen, lots of fun colors. So you can check that one out. We got those now in six different colors for you. Uh, we also came out with a, another Goulet calendar. So we did this last year for the first time, and we came out with another one this year. We did the format just a little bit different. It's mostly flat lays, um, but we did a lot of the ones that were from the um, art history series and just kind of mixed it up just last year was all Thursday things layouts. So we have some different things, and our team is so thoughtful. This is all photography that Sarah and Whitney have done, and, uh, you know, it's pretty cool. It's glossy paper. It's not super fountain pen friendly, and I apologize about that. Our options are kind of limited, but um, it's really just if you want to have 
pretty pictures of fountain pen stuff hanging up uh, year round. You can check out the calendar there. So we've got those on our site. Um, we'll have them for probably the next couple of months, maybe. Uh, we do one run of them and then we sell them out. So if you're interested in that, uh, maybe consider that uh, in the next few weeks or so before they're gone. Uh, we also launched the Peniter Snorkel, um, which is this handy little tool. Um, and we've got a video on this, so you can uh, check out more details on that. But it's a neat little tool for helping fill uh, converters out of your ink bottles. Uh, we also have the Platinum Caracusa Celluloid, which I don't have one here to show you, but you can check it out on our site. Really cool looking celluloid pen, but it's also engraved and backfilled with silver. Gorgeous pen. We used to have it here probably five years ago, uh, and it has not been available because I guess there's, it's really hard to get celluloid these right. days. So um, any pen that relies on celluloid is going to be pretty hit or miss. And uh, so this one, it, it actually came back. Uh, so Platinum hasn't had it available for years, and, and we got it again. So pretty excited about that. It's a gorgeous looking pen, uh, especially if you like dark blues like what I have on my wall here. Uh, another pen that we have now is the Pelican M600 Vibrant Orange. Uh, and if you're a fan of orange, I think you'll like this. This has kind of the same swirly pattern that the Ocean Swirl does, if you're familiar with that. So it's like a, a slightly more translucent Ocean Swirl that's orange instead of turquoise, right? Or, or, or teal, whatever the difference is between those. I don't know. That's up for debate. Um, but uh, it's a little bit translucent, so you can actually kind of see the grip. You can see the nib through the cap. So that's kind of nice. The M600 format's a nice medium-sized format. I think this is probably one of the most popular Pelican sizes just because it's not too big, it's not too small, it's kind of just right. Um, a few different nib size options for you, uh, and we have those available now. Really nice looking pen. Uh, what else have we got? We have the Diplomat Arrow Blue and Violet now have 14 karat gold nibs. Talked about that a little bit in right now as well. Really nice writing pens. Yovo nibs, German made Yovo nibs. Not a lot of pens have those Yovo gold nibs, um, but they are awesome. So if you wanted a different, slightly different writing experience from your steel nib Aero, you can check those out for 280. Uh, Field Notes has a new winter edition called Clandestine, uh, which is really kind of cool. And I think we'll have launched it by the time this video gets out. It's been kind of secret themed, but also actually secret. <laughs> um, so it's pretty cool. So you, you can check that out if you're interested in the Field Notes seasonal stuff. Uh, the Monograppa, we have the Elmo Verde Alta Piano. So this is the follow-up to the Rosa that we did before, which we only had for a few days. And um, I don't know how fast the green one's going to go here. It's a nice green, uh, kind of a similar pattern, actually, to what's in the Pelican. I don't think there's any relation there, um, but it's got kind of that. It's not just straight up swirls in it. It's got these little kind of tight knot, knotted swirls in here. I don't know if that's the right way to describe it, but um, good pen. Uh, nice weight to it, steel nibs, Yovo nibs, uh, they write really well. So I think these are going to be pretty popular. So you can check those out if you haven't already been on the email list to get them. Uh, Peniter is coming out with the pen called the Arco. So it's sort of similar to the, um, I don't have them here physically to show you, um, but they developed kind of a layered uh, brown pen similar, not exactly the same, but somewhat similar to the um, Omos Arco celluloid, which was uh, very, very popular back in its day. Um, this pen is a resin, it's not a celluloid, but it's manufactured in a similar fashion. Um, and it's got, uh, you know, anything that you call Arco is going to be pretty good. So it's kind of inspired um, by that design a little bit, um, but in a format that you can actually get now. Um, so that's kind of cool. So you can check that out. I'm going to try and show you more once I actually have it. Uh, Knock has come out with a couple of new Brass Town colors, so check those out. Pelican M400 Brown Tortoise, we're still kind of waiting on some of the nibs for those, um, but those are going to be coming soon if they're not here already by the time this launches. See, I'm recording this on Wednesday, so by Friday, you know, anything can happen, as John has learned in the last couple days. <laughs> couple days can make a world of difference around here, especially when holiday season is approaching. And then things that are coming still, we have Lamy gift sets on the way. We have another brand new exclusive next week, which I can't tell you anything about yet, but it's completely new, new brand, new everything. It's a new, it's a new pen that's coming. So get pumped about that. And don't ask my team because they won't tell you, but it'll be coming very early next week. So be on the lookout. Um, Benu has a new limited edition hexagon pen, which we haven't had uh, the hexagons for sale uh, before, but it's the same nib as what's on their pen, and uh, they do, they do um, well, at least last year they did, and they're, now they're doing another one this year, a seasonal limited edition, so we'll have some of those. 
Um, we'll have very soon the Namiki Emperor and the Yukari 100th anniversary. So those will be coming into our doors maybe in the next week or two. Um, the Paniter Mystery Filler is on the horizon. The Paniter Honeycomb Rose Gold Limited Edition is on the horizon. These all have question marks by our delivery dates on our calendar, but I know they're, they're just kind of looming out there. Um, the Conklin Duraflex Sunstone Limited Edition and the Visconti Van Gogh Gift Series. And then there's a bunch of other things. I can't even list every single thing here. Otherwise, I wouldn't have any questions to answer in q and We'd just be talking about new stuff. Um, okay, before I get into questions, I am going to be taking off Q&A next week because we have Thanksgiving. And, you know, everybody's going to be with families and traveling and stuff like that. So we're just going to take the week off. Um, so just go ahead and enjoy lots of pumpkin pie and turkey and other whatever things that you like to enjoy. Uh, and you'll have to go back and watch any of the other 233 Q&As that we've shot at some point <laughs> instead of a new one for next week. Um, and then because I'm not shooting one next week, I can't really talk about the stuff that we're doing for Black Friday and Cyber Monday, but we are working on some deals for that weekend. Um, I'm not going to hype them up too much in advance, but there are some things going on. So definitely sign up for the newsletter if you haven't already. Be on the lookout on our social channels and check our site during that whole weekend. So we're going to be launching, uh, we're not launching anything day specific. It's going to basically be through that whole weekend. Um, so you can check out the cool stuff that we're working on there. Should be pretty exciting. Um, and then because of everything that's going to be happening through that whole Black Friday, Cyber Monday weekend, um, you can expect some delays on some of the orders that we're going to have just because it's going to increase our volume, sort of like we had for Fountain Pen Day. Um, took us a little while to catch up. It wasn't our normal like one day turnaround. Um, it might take a little bit longer. And, and because it's a four day weekend like that, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a lot for us to catch up on. So the team might be behind for a few days kind of for most of that week following uh, Black Friday, Cyber Monday. So if you have anything that you really are in a rush to get, make sure you do like a FedEx expedited or something like that because we jump those to the front of the line. Or if you want, you can ask in the comments to expedite the order. We can't guarantee we're going to honor that, but we will try if you're in some extenuating circumstance and you uh, don't want to do the, the rushed shipping payment here. But that is what we got going on. Whew. Okay. That was a lot. And there's a lot more coming, so I hope you're ready for this Q&A. First one is going to be from Ephremesia on Instagram. How many different models of pens have you offered when you started and how many now? So originally, when we started out, uh, I only had my handmade pens because I was doing the handmade craftsman thing. So I had a, a couple, I mean, literally like three or four of those that were kind of hanging around at that point, but I wasn't actively really making anything. So I guess if you call those, I had maybe three or four pens, but really um, I wouldn't even consider that anything. So those were on the way out. And for the first year, all we sold was ink and paper. So we had zero pens. In fact, I even blogged about that in like July of our first year. I was like, we're called the Goulet Pen Company, but we don't sell any pens. Is that weird? Well, it was weird, but eventually we carried pens. So it all kind of worked out. Plus nobody was reading the blog back then. So I think it had zero comments on it for four years or something. Um, but anyway, uh, so it was zero pens. And now I had to actually go and count it up. And again, this could change by the day because we're launching so much. But I counted as of when I prepped for this video, 147 different fountain pen models. I'm not talking nib sizes or colors or anything like that. Just different models, 147. So, uh, you know, we've expanded a little bit. Things have changed over the last nine years. Uh, and that is one way to show how. This next question is from Cesar Regal on Instagram. How do you feel when you have to exchange pens? Um, I thought this was an interesting question. The way that I interpreted it when I read it was like when I, as a retailer, have to exchange a pen for someone else, not like when I have to exchange a pen of my own because I'm just I'm not in the normal circumstance because I'm running a pen company and that's not most people's circumstance. Um, <laughs> so I don't often exchange my own pens to myself. Um, but when I have to exchange a pen, that a customer has bought. Let's, that's how I'm interpreting the question. Um, so it's always a little bit disappointing, right? Like I want everybody to be able to buy the thing that is gonna fulfill all their hopes and dreams right off the bat every time. Realistically, that's just not possible. This is a retail business. You know, uh, returns are kind of a fact of life. You try to minimize them and keep them to an acceptable level. And the cool thing about what we do is we'll always make it right. So it's like, even if you have a bad experience or there's some crazy circumstance, the pen just doesn't work out, or if it's a preferential thing, you know, that's, we try, you 
you know, that's part of the reason why we do so many videos is we try to get out there like, hey, this is the pen, this is what it is, this is who might like it, this is who might not like it. Um, so we try to get that stuff out there, but it's not always gonna work out 100% like that. And we're gonna get some returns, but we always try to make it right and try to spend time troubleshooting. If there's something wrong with the pen, we try and figure out why. We try and figure out if you're holding the pen, like is there maybe another one that the grip is better for you? Um, you know, because not everything is made for everybody. So we try to really try hard to do education and troubleshooting as part of our returns process. Um, and so kind of ultimate, we view it as an opportunity to really um, help you as a, as a service. Um, and it's kind of redemptive, like we, we want someone to, to learn more about their own writing style and you know the brands are picking and stuff like that. So um, what might work better for them? So it's, it's not necessarily like, oh man, like there's an initial little twinge of, oh dang, that kind of sucks. But at the same time, there's a learning opportunity to come from that and there's an opportunity to wow uh, you as a customer uh, through an experience like that. And that's how my whole team likes to view it and that's how we you know, continue preach that too so that's how we look at it trying to take something bad and turn it into something good all right next question we have is from rs bilgen on instagram what was the toughest business lesson you learned along the way <laughs> i had a hard time i'd think about this one a little bit because i've had a lot of tough business lessons that have happened along the way um, i think if i had to summarize a lot of what's probably caused a lot of my tough tough business lessons um, has been that people can't read my mind Okay, so anybody who's ever like been in a position of management or had to start their own business or I don't know, interacted with a family member, uh, you probably know that other people can't read your mind. And even when you think that you're being clear about something, uh, other people may not be able to know exactly your experiences and where you're coming from and what your intentions are and maybe what your vision is. So you have to speak that stuff out. Um, my leadership style has always been to kind of lead by example. Um, and often that requires me being more explicit than just me doing and acting out what I want and then just hoping that it rubs off on others or that people pick up on my intentions and then want to emulate that. So, you know, I'm, I've learned over the years that I'm, I'm pretty driven. I'm a little more risk taking than most, maybe more stress, uh, stress, uh, uh, inducing than most, <laughs> uh, which is part of why I am where I am and why, why our company has kind of come from where it has. Um, but not effort necessarily everyone wants that, even if they look up to me or what I've done, they don't, it's not necessarily for them in that exact style. So um, me just doing it and hoping that others come along is not enough. Um, and I didn't quite realize that, especially in the beginning. So I have to be very conscious about how I share my thoughts, my intentions, my vision, the process, um, and, and pull others along with me rather than just like view myself as somebody who's like forging through the jungle with a machete and then just like I turn around I'm like oh I've lost everybody you know they're not following behind me like I thought you know I have to be intentional about like hey let's all let's all get in this together and maybe slow myself down a little bit so that we can all walk uh, together so that's in a very metaphorical way that's kind of what's had to happen uh, for me so that's been the toughest business lesson um, but also one of the most rewarding as well Next one's from Bobby J on Facebook. Why don't you do pen shows? I do get asked this a lot, which is why I wanted to answer it again, because um, I continue to get asked it. Um, so of course there are pen shows, which is one of the cool things about this hobby, uh, this lifestyle, if you will, is um, you know there's probably 13, maybe 15 pen shows every year that happen around the country um, and maybe more around the world. Um, but especially in the US, they, they do crop up and it's a really cool experience to go. I went to three of them this, this year. I did Atlanta, DC, and San Francisco. Um, and I love it for the social aspect of it and for being part of the community. Um, I've only ever worked as a vendor one show, which was DC in 2010. And it just about killed me. I mean, it was so much work. We had, our son was really young at the time. Um, it just took a lot out of us in terms of travel and stuff like that. Um, and it's just, it just wasn't for me. It took too much out of me. It was a huge distraction from running Goulet Pens in the form that we do the vast majority of the time, which is online and doing the video thing and all that, um, kind of as you see it today. Um, you know, Rachel doesn't travel as easily as I do. You know, she's had some anxiety and stuff that's been triggered by travel. So for her, traveling's really hard and it's very taxing on us as a family. Um, so, uh, you know, and something I actually thought about 
that I hadn't really thought of before uh, until literally I was prepping for this question, which is maybe why subconsciously I was like, I should take this question again. I self-analyzed a little bit, um, but in the early, early days of Goulet Pens, when I was trying to make it as a pen craftsman, I did so many arts and craft shows and you know wine festivals and various outdoor venues, indoor venues, you name it, all over the place. And every single one was like me getting my hopes up, doing tons of prep, and then being disappointed because my stuff didn't sell that well. And I'm not naturally like a, you know, as much as I may come across as a Billy Mays type, you know, salesman here, ShamWow guy or whatever, uh, it's really not my nature to do that, especially in like a, you know, a public setting like that. It's, it's very unnatural for me. So it takes a lot out of me and I don't really do as well as I probably should in those types of settings. Um, so for me, I actually have a lot of memories associated with the early days of Goulet Pens of doing shows and having a negative experience, like a negative emotional experience out of that. Um, so maybe there's like some subconscious thing where I just, I'm not excited about being a vendor at a pen show because I have so many experiences that were kind of burned into me from the earliest days of Goulet Pens where, you know, I was pouring my heart and soul as a craftsman into these things. And then people just walking by and being like, no, I don't like your stuff, which was like, at me, it was like, no, I don't like you as a craftsman or whatever. And of course I'm like over all that and my ego is not tied up into it, but there's probably still a little bit of that in there of just like the little younger me that's like, oh man, nobody likes my stuff. I'm trying so hard. And then honestly, once, once I stopped making pens and I started doing Goulet pens in its current fashion, I had to like emotionally separate myself and heal myself from all that. And then I just like never looked back. So for me, like to go back to pen shows is kind of like revisiting a chapter of myself that I really kind of closed off and I'm not like super eager to get into again. So for me, like transacting at a pen show, not super interesting to me, um, but I do love to go there socially and interact with the community, which is the capacity that I've been doing it for the last few years. But um, it is really tough to find that time because it takes, you know, it's like a four or five day period out of my life, away from my family, away from the business that's operating here. It really takes a lot out of me to be able to do that. So I have to really pick and choose and have some special reasons to be able to go to some of these things. So it's not off the table forever, um, but it's definitely challenging to the point where doing it regularly really makes it difficult. So um, mad props to people that do do it regularly. I think it's awesome. I think the Pen Show community is amazing. And if you do have one that's going on near you, you absolutely should go to at least one at some point in your life. If you're taking the time to sit here and watch an hour long Q&A, you're probably enough into it where you would really enjoy a pen show. Um, but uh, as far as going to them like 10 a year, I just, I know that's never gonna be a thing for me. All right, Blake Seymour on Facebook. Blake, Blake Moore C on Facebook, excuse me. Um, how do you determine what reviewers to work with and what determining factors for what pens, inks, et cetera, get sent out for review? And then what would cause you to end a relationship with a reviewer? All right, so Blake Moore is asking for a three in one here. Um, reviewers to work with, largely it's been, we haven't had time to work with anybody, so largely it's been, well, okay, we'll put you on ice, but we're not really gonna have time. Um, or some of them it's been like people like Stephen Brown or Matt Anderson or, uh, sorry, Matt Armstrong or, um, you know, David Parker, you know, Fig Boot. Um, there are people who, you know, Kara Benz. There have been people that are like so deep in the community and I meet them at pen shows and stuff. That's a little bit easier. Other people who I don't know them as much and they just kind of reach out and like, hey, I'm starting up a blog, can I review some stuff? Honestly, it's a lot of time and a lot of effort to coordinate that kind of stuff, more than you would think. So we've had to be very selective and a lot of it's just come down to, we don't have the bandwidth, you know? And so Margaret helps me coordinate that kind of stuff. And, um, but a lot of it is just serendipity, largely, you know? Does somebody have the opportunity? Do I happen to know them well enough? Or does Margaret know them well enough? And it just kind of works out. There's a product that really makes sense for them that we have adequate stock of that would make sense because the worst thing is like when we send out something to be reviewed and then it's a limited item or it's not available and the review goes out and then no one can buy it anywhere and they get frustrated and all that kind of stuff so all these things kind of go into a, a, a mixing pot of decisions that happens and it's often so complicated we're just not able to make it happen um, you know, and as far as factors for what pens, inks, whatever, you know, I like to, to send stuff to reviewers that are things that they want to review or that makes sense for them. Cause generally if they're picking it and they're excited about it, they're going to invest more into the review they actually do. And maybe you could view that as they might have some bias towards it or whatever, but let's be honest, anybody that's taking the time to do reviews and they're not getting paid and it's just for fun, there's going to be bias anyway, because it takes so much time to do reviews. Like 
hours to do reviews by the time you're talking about the editing and the time that it takes and the communication and the written portion and all that. It's a lot of time. And to do that completely unbiased and very scientifically, it would make a terrible review, first of all, but also it wouldn't be as fun and engaging and somebody would burn out in like three seconds. Um, so they gotta be excited about it. So largely let them pick what it is or if there's something that we have that we know we really want to share with the community, we'll try and get it out there. Um, and then what would cause you to end a relationship with a reviewer? We haven't really had any that have like blown up in our face, um, but we have had some that, you know, if somebody you know, has been reviewing and you know, they'll review for like six months really hot and then you know, they'll, their life will kind of take over and they'll stop posting regularly. So if it's like somebody's not reviewing regularly or active in the community, that's one thing that could kind of uh, lessen the excitement there. If they start getting involved in like really controversial stuff, we usually try to stay away from that. Um, if somebody's really tough to work with, like they just don't communicate well and we're always having to follow up and you know, they're just really take a lot of time, that just makes it harder. Um, and then somebody who takes stuff but then never actually gets around to reviewing it or they take forever to review it, that's not super exciting either. Um, so just, you know, make a commitment like, hey, I'd like to review something, get it done in a reasonably re reasonable time manner. Um, you know, and, and it's something that um, as we look into the future, it's something I really would love to do more because I review, reviewed a ton of stuff. I know it's a lot of work, but at the same time, like, I don't have all the perspective. I like to involve others on my team. I like to involve others in the community to review stuff too. Um, but again, it does take a lot of time. And that's, for me, at least, that's been time that for me to coordinate that, I've had to take away from me being able to do reviews. So I've always opted towards, let me try and produce them myself rather than um, coordinate getting stuff out there. So as we grow in the future, I could see that being something we maybe look to do more in the future, but that's yet to be seen. We don't have like a specific initiative set at this moment to make that happen. So um, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. Next one is DMM0629 on Instagram. What would be the pros and cons of having a public store area to your location? Um, again, this is another one I get asked about all the time. Why don't you guys have a brick and mortar store? Um, so pros, you know, we would get to see pen people. Uh, and when you're buying stuff in person, it's a huge win for you as a customer. You, you know, you would get to physically hold the products. That obviously would be cool. Um, we could carry some new brands like Mont Blanc. Like I've straight up had conversations with them where they're like, if you had a physical store, we can do business together. But because you don't, we're not going to do it. And that's very tempting. But at the same time, it's just not, uh, it's not in our mission to do that right now. Uh, maybe there's some other brands that would require a physical location too, um, but uh, Mont Blanc is a big one. The cons, and there's a lot of them, <laughs> um, but managing the inventory on, on location and on the web at the same time, trying to share from both of those makes things a little more complicated. Um, significant costs and just ongoing um, you know, uh, operation of setting up a physical storefront and the expenses and, and staffing and everything that's related to that apart from just doing it on the web. Especially because like we have um, hired people with very specific skill sets to do things like email and live chat and phone calls and that's a little different skill set than standing on a retail storefront showing people physical pens face to face. Um, yes, they still know pen knowledge but it would be a little bit different. You know, we would hire more extroverted people as opposed to perhaps some of the more introverted people that we may have on our staff right now. And then of course, um, you know, there's other things like possible theft and just other things when you, when you it, it deal with having the public kind of coming into your space, it just makes things a little more complicated. Um, but not to mention in our physical location where we are here, it's actually in our lease because we're in an office complex. Uh, it's actually in our lease that we can't have like a public retail space because there's different zoning restrictions and stuff like that. So you have to actually buy, uh, buy or lease retail space to have the public coming in and out of your location. And we are not zoned for that where we are. So where I am right now, it would mean actually setting up a separate physical location, not just having it here. So that's kind of, that's a, that's a huge one. Um, and uh, it was hard enough for us to find this location when we moved already, but then to try and find a physical retail space with office and warehouse would be very complicated. And it wasn't something that we were looking to do, especially last year. So it's really not something we're set up to do. So I'm not gonna say it could never happen, um, but it's certainly not something that's in the plans for the foreseeable future. Next one is from Rosh Clicks on Instagram. Do you think your company has cause to increase the market size for fountain pens? Um, okay, so have we increased the fountain pen market? Uh, I don't really know <laughs> for certain. There's not really good data out there, especially to say like, yes, 
we grew the market, you know? No, and I definitely don't have the ego tied up to say like, yeah, we are the ones making the market grow. Um, it has certainly been something that I have sought out to do, especially because when I first saw what the fountain pen market was in 2009, I attended the DC Pen Show in August of 2009, and I saw that it was pretty much all white-haired folks in the room, and there was no younger people in it. And I was like, what's gonna happen to this hobby if there's not a way for people that didn't grow up using fountain pen school, fountain pens in school, uh, for this, you know, younger generations who need to be exposed to them in order to know that they're awesome and they exist, how is that gonna happen? So that's why we went so hard into the education and the video and social media, is because that's how we saw that we could spread that impact uh, into the pen community. Now, I would like to think we've had some impact, but I don't really know uh, 100% if we have, or I don't know if it was just we're kind of riding a wave, like maybe the industry turned, you know, just like, you know, everywhere, just like shopping malls are not as popular as they used to be. People are buying online now. So it might've been we were just in the right place at the right time. So I don't really know, but either way, I don't really think about that all too much. I just know that I believe in what we're doing and the way that we're doing it. So that's why we spend so much of our time uh, doing that. Uh, what I have seen is there've been a lot of brick and mortar pen stores that have closed down since we have been in business. Now, I don't think it's because we've never targeted anybody or, you know, it's like, I don't like showrooming. I don't like it when people go to a physical store and then buy online. I've never promoted that. I think, especially if you have a physical pen store, like go talk to those owners and go support their business because there's so few of them left and they're usually only in it because they love doing it and because um, they're passionate about the community. So you should absolutely support them whenever you can. Um, but it's probably just part of a larger trend, just of like more stuff going online. And we just kind of happen to be uh, in the right place there. So I take nothing for granted. And I think that everything that we do um, that we feel will help increase the market is something that we're gonna, gonna try to do. So that is something that we find uh, motivating for us. Next one is from CLB Droid on Instagram. Was there a point when you and Rachel thought of packing it in and getting typical jobs? <laughs> um, you know, it was tempting there, especially in the early years. No, um, it's funny, actually, Rachel had a very successful career in the earliest days of the business. Um, she was the one pulling the financial wagon while I was floundering around with my pen making thing. Um, so that's actually what helped get us off the ground. So I have no doubt Rachel could go out tomorrow and get any number of probably three dozen different specialized jobs um, because she's so capable. Uh, me, uh, may, maybe not, uh, you know, I don't know. Um, she, she could do really well. She thrives in that environment. She always did well in school academically. She had a really good uh, career before we started this pen business. Me, I was like three days into my internship after I graduated and I was like, I couldn't wait to get out of there. I like mentally fired my boss and, you know, tried to do everything I could to not have to work for somebody else. And then I went and power washed houses with my dad and did the pen making thing. I'm a bit of a maverick when it comes to that kind of stuff. So my, my resume is not super strong on paper. Um, I think I would be pretty unmanageable and I have absolutely zero desire in my life to work for anybody else. Um, I kind of gauge my own, this is just me personally, I just kind of gauge my own happiness and success based on the fact that I don't have to work for anybody else. Um, that's just me and I've kind of always felt that way. So, um, you know, obviously for my family, I would do whatever I have to do, um, but I know that I would explore every other possible avenue um, before I would do that. So, um, you know, what it really boils down to is uh, where we are with the pen business, especially nine years in now, it's like, you know, we, we pretty well figured it out. And, and technically, if you want to consider from the very beginning when I started making pens, that was July of 2007. So it's really been like 11 years, uh, 11 and a half years that I've been kind of doing the pen thing. Um, and at this point, like I love it every day, even more than the day before this many years in. So I really feel like we're called to be doing what we're doing. So I can't envision anything else that would be better for us. Of course, you never know where it could go in the future, um, but it's not something that we actively think about, like what if this thing goes under, what would we do? I don't really have a plan B right now because plan A is working so well and I love it so much that there's no need. All right, Eris Bilgen on Instagram asked, what is the advice that you wish you had when you started? 
Um, you know, I think probably the, one of the biggest things that I wish I had known when I started was to spend the time up front to define and clarify my why, my purpose, um, mission, vision, and values. Um, it's something that's really important to the, what we do now. Um, and uh, I think especially before, if you have a small business, uh, before you start hiring others, to have that defined really just helps not only you, but helps out them so much to understand anybody that you're bringing into your little world, uh, what it is that they're stepping into. I think self-awareness is extremely critical um, and living true to your values is something that's really the only way to last long-term, especially because when you start a business, it's gonna take everything that you have. I mean, round the clock, it's gonna take all of you to, to make it happen. Um, so if you're not living true to yourself, then it's, it's gonna really be tough to keep that up. Um, so, you know, Rachel and I uh, did this, but it really wasn't, uh, it wasn't early enough. Um, we went through a lot of pain early on because, again, kind of like I alluded to earlier, I thought that I could just kind of live it out and that others would just kind of see it happening and intuit it. Um, but it just wasn't as obvious, especially as we grew. Um, I was just spending less time rubbing elbows with everybody day to day. So I needed to define it so that people could know without spending as much time with me personally every day um, that, uh, you know, kind of what's going on around here. So we didn't actually, excuse me, we didn't actually define our mission and values and all that until we had about 20 people in our company about five years in. That would have been way easier to clarify and I probably would have had, um, you know, a much easier time um, speaking about some of the things that we're doing had I actually sat down and really defined those things up front. Um, so, you know, advice for any of you who are maybe thinking about starting something or maybe you have a small business, really spend the time doing that. You know, Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why, is really, really good. Um, Dave Ramsey, his book, Entree Leadership, helped me there. And then um, Tony Shea and his book, Delivering Happiness, had some really good insights to me. That's really, Delivering Happiness is really the one that, that made it click for me because he went through the th same thing as Zappos. He had like 400 people in his company at Zappos before he defined his values. So I thought that was really fascinating. And that's what gave me hope of like, oh, it's okay if you don't have it from day one, you can still figure it out if you already have a team in place. Um, so all of those really kind of inspired me at that time to get it done. But now that we do, it's like totally deeply ingrained into everything we do, the hiring process, the, the way we, you know, carry products and the way we interact with customers, it's, it's all throughout the company. Okay, rolling along. Mike Mitchell 357 on Instagram. I understand it's probably a long way off, but I frequently have this question about family-owned companies. What is planned for Goulet Pens after Brian and Rachel? I know you have kids, but you seem like the type of people that will support them if they choose to go another way too. Is there an alternate plan? So there's kind of like a two-parter to this, like what happens with me and Rachel, or like after we leave and like, and then throwing my kids in the mix, obviously, like when you think of family business, you think of succession throughout the family, right? Um, it's interesting because I actually have perspective on that because my parents had a family business growing up, which is part of why I wanted to do this because I saw them do the family business and it was a much smaller family business. They had it in the house, just my parents. They had like one, maybe two employees um, while they were in the house. And I kind of got to grow up as a kid, you know, stapling invoices to Manila folders. And, you know, they had a desktop publishing and like printing business so that I would get to like, you know, do all kinds of projects uh, all the time. They had one that was like, they printed up brochures and there was like a franchise deck building company that was kind of in our local area. So we would have to do overprinting and print out the addresses and stuff. So like as a nine year old, I had to like, you know, manage FileMaker and I had to run, you know, we would get purchase orders and I would have to run overprinting through these things for this franchise and pack it up and ship it out UPS and all that kind of stuff. So um, no doubt that informed some of my views of what it meant to work. And then of course my parents would pay me for that stuff because I was doing legitimate work. Um, so, you know, I was able to save up for that and then I was able to go to college without having any debt and all that. And so I just viewed so much of that as a positive experience, apart from just like having a job opportunity after graduating or whatever. My parents never pushed that on me, especially because the printing business is a really tough business. So I think in some ways they didn't want me to go into that business. They were just trying to do it to, to make ends meet, right? Um, but for me, I mean, obviously the pen thing, this is, a, this is a pretty sweet gig. Um, you know, and I absolutely love it. I would love if my kids were involved in it. I'm exposing them to pens and stuff like that, but you know, I would never want to try to put my kids into this if it wasn't the best thing for them. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, it's also because 
uh, it wouldn't be the best thing for my team if I was to try to put my kids in where somebody else maybe had a better opportunity. So for me, it's all kind of meritocracy. It's like whoever ends up being the best fit, I'm going to expose my kids to it just like I'm going to expose them to music. I'm going to expose them to science and math and all kinds of other things. You know, this will just be something in the mix. But no doubt, the thing that I'm going to try to do more than anything is expose them to the concept of work. And so they understand what it is the value of doing work getting paid, saving money, earning things, you know, tying the association between doing work and then buying stuff. I feel like it's really important, especially for kids to understand so that then when they grow up, you know, they have that concept later on. So that I'm really trying to lock down. But as far as where that comes from necessarily, I'm going to teach them just like their mommy and daddy have done to live out an example is find something you really love that matches up to your skills and that you really can find yourself doing for the long term. And that's what's going to make you happiest, not doing what mom and dad did. Right. So I have zero ego tied up in what my parents do or what my kids do in this business moving forward. Of course, I think it'd be cool if that happened, but then I'll expose them to it and explore that as an option. But I'm no means am I going to force that to happen. And then just for me and Rachel personally, you know, for, we have no aspirations to like flip this business next year and go start some other thing. I don't really feel like I have the serial entrepreneur bug in me. Of course, I like follow people like Gary Vaynerchuk and these other, you know, I watch like Shark Tank and all this kind of stuff. And you think like, oh, it's so glitzy, glamoury, all that kind of stuff. But the truth is like, you know, whether you're, you know, getting into serial businesses or whether you work for somebody else or whether you work for the government, even, you know, it's like, is it suited to what your skills are? Are you happy with where you're at? And the truth is Rachel and I are just really happy doing this business. So I'm not in any rush to do anything different. Um, I think there's way more to do in this business and in the pen industry. And so we're just going to keep going deeper and going harder in this. Um, and then as far as succession for us, you know, that is something that I'm going to very much take a long-term approach. We're trying not to work ourselves so hard that we burn out and end up in a situation where it's like a crisis we have to get out. Of course, you never know. There could be something crazy that happens, but Really, for the long term, I'm going to view this as like, a, hey, this is going to be a three to five year thing if I get to the point where I think I may want to exit. Um, and then I would only do that if I had something you know, else that I was looking forward to, not just wanting to get out. Um, I would look to set up succession. So we have a, a big you know, leadership kind of training and service aspect to what we do in our company. So I would want to build up others, train others, and allow and, and really kind of backfill myself. In fact, that's one of the principles I have is like, I'm continually trying to fire myself, right? I'm trying to raise up others and get them to do something better than me so that I then am not needed in so many areas. And the only problem is we keep doing that and then I keep taking on more things for myself. So, <laughs> but when I get to the point where I don't want to be involved in it anymore, I'll, I'll tone that part of it down, train up others and I'll like maybe look to extract a little bit, but who knows? I haven't yet actually tried to do that. So that'd be a whole other chapter of my life, but at least that's the, kind of the approach that I'm taking on it now. All right, next one is Kay Zender on Instagram. What is your proudest moment at the Goulet Pen Company? Now, this one was really tough. Um, really, really tough because I've had a lot of really proud moments here. Um, so, so many different ones, but I do have one that kind of stands out. Um, you know, uh, I'll mention a couple of kind of honorable mention ones. So like when we did the um, top workplace in Richmond last year and our team was an internal survey that was rated by an outside party, um, rated us top three place to work in Richmond. That was really pretty cool. Very validating just for the culture that we have here. And spent a lot of time um, trying to build a strong culture. And I feel like that's really, really important in a company and to have our team validate. That was super rewarding for me. Um, moving into this physical space was really awesome um, because again, it was kind of a reflection of our culture and just kind of like it was a really big milestone of just like hey we've we've almost kind of made it you know like we felt like a, a more legit company having a physical space that reflected who we were in our culture and our and our colors and, and all that stuff um, but uh, you know if I really had to, to, to boil it down to one thing I would go much much more humble than all of that um, taking it way way back um, it has to be when Rachel and I drew our first paycheck from the business because you got to figure that didn't happen until it was like October of 2010. And you got to figure I started making pens in July of 2007. So it was about three and a half years of passion, hobby, you know, kind of that status of trying to make something, trying to get something working, having a desire in my heart to make something happen, but never really being financially validated that I'd established a viable business out of it really was a glorified hobby. And as Rachel so affectionately puts it, she called it our sinking ship back when I was <laughs> doing the pen making thing, partly because 
it really was kind of a self-funding hobby. That's really the spirit of where the pen making thing came about because I loved woodworking and I just wanted to sell enough pens so that I could continue the fun of the hobby. You know, it's like for any serial hobbyist, that's the dream, right? So you can just keep doing that hobby. So I would sell pens and I'd buy tools and I'd sell pens and I'd buy more wood and I'd sell pens and <laughs> buy more tools. Uh, and that was great until we had a mortgage and a baby and I was like, oh crap, I really got to get my act together here. Uh, how do I do this? You know, uh, and it was kind of almost a bit, little bit like that. But um, once we really decided like, okay, we got to do this. And honestly, you know, to back it up just a little bit, um, I was doing the, the thing. We'd gotten into the fountain pen thing. It was starting to gain some speed. I still wasn't actually paying myself anything. The business was making uh, a little bit. You know, we were not losing money at that point. Um, but Rachel, we had our first kid. She was on maternity leave. And then like two weeks before she was supposed to go back, she decided just emotionally, she's like, I can't go back. My manager is driving me crazy. And, you know, I just, I can't leave our son. And I don't want to go back. And I was like, okay, <laughs> we didn't plan for that. Um, so I was like, let me do the math. Okay, we have about seven months off of savings if we eat ramen every night uh, to try to get this business off the ground. Otherwise, we're gonna have to figure something else out. And so that was our like, you know, dive in head first, you know, blindly just, we have no choice but to make this thing work. And so after going through that immersive an experience, with a mortgage and a baby and just like everything was on the line. I had no safety net whatsoever and we had to make it work. And then to go through that, we've worked, we never worked as hard as we did for like that seven month period there. And then finally, when we got to the point where we could financially pay ourselves and get that paycheck, that was just like, we did it. I was like, I was just like, nothing can top this really. And it's like, we've done some amazing things since then, but just that, concept of like we had this completely wild idea of selling pens on the internet and at that point actually we were just barely even getting into selling pens it was ink and paper you know just selling fountain pen stuff on the internet to think that we could do that and actually get paid for it and do it full time was completely ludicrous um so the fact that we finally were able to draw a paycheck really just validated that and then everything since then has just been like wow this is even more amazing than i put it because i could barely imagine breaking even and making a paycheck because it had three and a half years of trying to make it happen and and couldn't so that was really really cool and it's going to be pretty tough to top that one all right <clears throat> next question is from manulo on twitter uh, Brian, describe your feelings you got in every big change you faced. Selling pens, moving to other locations, etc. And I mean the collective you, the family, the team, and you personally. Man, you guys like to pack in some density to these questions, right? Um, so I would say we've faced some real doozies over the years. Um, <laughs> you know, me deciding to work in the business full time, Rachel quitting her job. The first time we had to hire somebody was a terrifying experience, um, especially because we were 25 at the time. Uh, moving our business out of the house, uh, moving our website multiple times, moving our building multiple times, um, putting our kids in daycare for the first time was terrifying. It was just so many of these things. And, and really it was similar feelings to all of these of just like, especially for us with this business, it was growing really rapidly. We were never quite able to like, fully plan out multiple years ahead and say, okay, these are all the things that are that we know are gonna happen to us. And so when we get to this point, we'll prepare this and we know what's coming. It was like, oh my gosh, we're just pulling our hair out. We have to figure out something. We need a pressure release valve. Okay, here, let's do this thing. And it was like, okay, we had five people working out of our house, not including us. And then it's like, we looked up the county code and it was like, you'd only have one family member, <laughs> one non-family member working out of your house. And we're like, crap, like we have to move out of our house in the next month. So it's like we had to go find a commercial space. So it's like we didn't even have time really to think about these things and fully like plan it out, you know. And part of that was intentional. Part of it is we knew it was gonna be so hard both to have kids and to run a business uh, like we did. We knew it was gonna be so hard. I almost, I almost chose to do it really young so that I was purposely ignorant of how hard it was gonna be because I was so willing and just wanted to do it um, and willing to work just absolutely crazy um, that uh, I knew that if I knew what I was fully getting into that I probably wouldn't have the energy to do it. As funny as that sounds. Um, and I think anybody, especially who's a, a parent can relate. Uh, <laughs> it's like, if you fully knew everything it would take to have kids, 
would you really want to do, you know? Um, but anyway, there's a really good saying um, that I think about a lot and I say it to my team all the time, and John's probably gonna hear it for the first time now, um, but it's a saying that says, change is scary in the beginning, messy in the middle, and beautiful in the end. You know, and if there's one thing about my personality style, it's that I am not afraid of change. In fact, I probably am more of a change agent and an instigator, uh, and I will make it happen if it's not already happening to me. Um, but that pretty much sums it up. It's like when you reach certain points in your life, and everybody's got different levels of comfort with change and things like that, I totally get that. Like we have an entire company filled with people who have different personalities, and everybody's got different levels of comfort, and that's, that's great. Like there's different strengths to that and all that. But for me personally, I'm more of a change agent so I've probably just I've gone through more of it than than probably most people uh, at my age right um, just because I've really leaned into it um, but again it's it's always scary that's the thing is it always starts out scary even for somebody like me where you know I'm used to change and it's very rapid and I'm often the instigator of it it's still as scary because there's always this element of you don't really know what's gonna happen it's uncomfortable it's new and so you have to you have to kind of get past that and it never really goes away it's not that you don't have that fear it's just that you learn to not listen to it or not dwell on it too much you have that feeling you recognize it and once you've gone through it so many times you're like oh you get that little feeling in your gut you're like oh man this is really crazy and then you're like okay yeah it's crazy but it was crazy before here and here and here and here and here and i know that it's not going to be forever i just gotta get past that and then you start to go and then you work through that. And it, so it lasts like shorter and shorter amounts of time with each crazy event that you go through. Um, so keeping that in mind that it's scary in the beginning and then as you're figuring it out, it gets messy, but in the end, it's gonna be something amazing. So that, that phrase is something that I really keep in mind a lot. And that really speaks to a lot of what I've experienced uh, throughout my you know, big change uh, lifestyle. And then as far as answering the complexity of the question for the family and team and everything else, you know, it's just, it's, it's kind of the same for everybody, but the best thing you can do if it's, so that's like me personally, mainly, but you're talking about, you know, the family team, all that kind of stuff. Really, it's just over communicating with everybody. Everybody's going to go move at different speeds. There's some times where I might be comfortable with change, but others may slow down and that may actually be a good thing for me even. Um, so it's just communicating and making sure that everybody's on the same page and everybody's moving together. Um, yeah. All right, got a few more left. A lot of questions in this one and we are rolling along, but I'm not gonna stop yet. Jillian Barr on Instagram says, do employees get a discount and are employee purchases embargoed or rationed on some way on super high demand items? Um, you know, you could probably guess, many of you who probably daydream about working here, um, yeah, that is one of the perks uh, that they get here. Um, so yes, our team members, as we call them, uh, do get a discount here. Um, not gonna say exactly what because it's proprietary, but let me just say it's, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty significant. So um, really it just comes down to we want the people that work here to be in love with their products. So we try to make it as accessible as possible for them to get super into it. Um, uh, everybody gets free ink samples here. Um, they get a significant discount uh, on our regular products and then we give them periodic free stuff as well. So um, if you're around here, whether you're into pens or not, you're gonna get pens in your hands just because that's part of what we're all about here. Um, you know, definitely there's some like super hot limited stuff. If that happens, you know, we'll usually reach out to our team and try to assess demand. You know, obviously no one here in our company, we know that we all are here to serve you all as customers. So we don't ever want to like take something out of your hands for ourselves. So that's always a fine balance to walk. There's, there's usually not that many circumstances where we're so limited on something that all of our team wants that we know is not going to be readily available. So we'll usually just kind of talk that out with the people that are super interested. Um, but uh, usually, you know, we're able to, um, you know, give our team, at least for those that are interested, we'll, we'll debate like how much quantity we have a certain thing. And if we get some people that are interested, you know, yeah, they'll be able to kind of, you know, get first dibs on it, if you will. But only if we feel like it's, it's we're still gonna have enough for everybody that's that's kind of interested. So, um, you know, it's, it's pretty rare that we're in that boat and we usually just have to play it by ear. But in general, we like to encourage our team to be super into stuff because, when they are, they're going to do a better job for you all. And they're going to be more excited. They're going to be more passionate. They're going to be more into this. And all in all, as a company, we're going to serve you better if we are passionate and really into the stuff that we are selling. All right. I have another question. Oh, this is another one from Jillian Barr. I didn't even realize that. Okay. 
Well, Jillian's got a couple of good questions here. Uh, how do you determine which items within a line to stock, and how do you determine how much inventory? Sometimes I'm slow to decide to pull the trigger on something expensive, and while I'd like to get it from you, you're sold out, but other online vendors aren't, so I go with them. Frowny face emoticon. All right, so this is, uh, this is an ever-moving target for us. Uh, so we do look at historical data. We try to you know, look at stuff, as, um, especially within a brand or within a specific type. If it's a new like, color of a pen and we have a bunch of other colors, we'll look at you know, all pens in a similar price range across that color. We'll look at pens within that um, you know, brand or model. And so we try to project out stuff as intelligently as, as we possibly can. Um, but sometimes we just don't have that much data to go off of. So we have to largely do our instincts. Um, but really, no matter what, it's kind of an educated guess. Um, especially with the really expensive stuff, you know, if we're really wrong and we buy double the inventory that we need on a really expensive thing, that could keep us from having the funds to be able to buy other new things. So we have to be intelligent. You know, anyone who's in the retail business or has anything to do with retail, you know that you live and die by how well you manage your inventory. So that's something really important, especially with us, we're a no-debt company. So it's really important that we are intelligent with how we manage our inventory. So sometimes what it might mean, um, based on our own projections, if something ends up being really hot and we didn't quite project it enough, we could be out of stock of it. Oftentimes though, what happens is we try to buy what we think is the right amount and we end up getting a third of what we ordered. And then the manufacturer doesn't have it or it gets allocated to other retailers or whoever. You know, We try to project stuff out and work with our, our suppliers to get us the right amount of stuff. But oftentimes, you know, the manufacturers are small, like Nathan Tardif with Noodlers, for example. He's like one guy in his house that's making this stuff. Or, you know, there's other ones who are, are multinational and they may prioritize their local market more and we just kind of get the leftovers, you know? So it's like, it really varies depending on what products you're talking about. Um, but oftentimes there's stock issues of especially really hot things, you know, new stuff that a lot of times it's just we get shorted on stuff. So it's, it's kind of out of our hands. So with all that in mind, we view it as it's our responsibility, it's part of our job to manage our inventory really well and to buy stuff properly um, so that it's in stock for you when you want it. If we don't manage it well and you go and buy it somewhere else, I can't really fault you for that, you know? You, as the customer, uh, you're kind of the king and queen. So uh, if you have something, if you need it, if you want it, whatever, if we are not there for you by having it in stock, well then, that's where the market comes in and you have alternatives and you can shop around. I don't really get up too upset about that because I view that as that should be on us to be able to do something about that by managing our stock better or having better vendor relationships and, and projecting that kind of stuff out. So. Um, I totally understand from your mindset, if you really want it and we don't have it, how you'd want to shop around. That said, sometimes it's outside of our hands and that ends up just kind of sucks for us, right? Um, but at the same time, you got to do what you got to do. Um, so the thing I'll say is you can always reach out to us and you can ask, you know, sometimes it's a matter of, look, it's, it's on the truck and it just got delivered to the wrong building and FedEx has got to pick it back up and bring it to us and we'll have it here in two days, you know, stuff like that. So some, if you reach out to us about a specific product, especially something high end, you know, you can reach out to us about a specific product and we will communicate to you when we expect to get them in if we know. Sometimes we don't always know and we can't give you a great answer, um, but we are willing to chase down, you know, pretty much any product and say, okay, this is when it's coming back in stock. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll do our best to try to figure that out. But we're always appreciative of the app. app the opportunity to do that and to serve you as a customer. All right, next question I've got here, and we are nearing the end to left. Um, Stuart J on Facebook says, as your company has grown and flourished, have your values had to change to fit with that growth compared to when you started? And has anything stayed the same? Super interesting question, and I really wanted to talk about this because values are such an important part of what we do here. Um, so as we've grown, we've definitely had to change a lot. I mean, look at we're now in a building that's almost 24,000 square feet. And if you watched some of my earliest videos, you saw that I was shooting them in my bedroom with dirty laundry piled up in the background. Now I just have, you know, Lego rockets and things like that. But um, it's a little better organized than it was back in those days. And we have a team of 40 people now instead of just me and Rachel trying to figure things out on our own. So clearly a lot has changed. You know, things in terms of our org structure, uh, meeting rhythms that we have, our physical location, just our methods of communication. A lot of that stuff has had to change because it's just practical, um, you know, and especially because nine years in this business, social media has changed a lot. 
the whole context almost has changed, but there's definitely one thing that should stay constant and that is your values. The values are something that are your bedrock to the way that you run your company. Just like if you have a family institution, the values at which you have for your family are what you true back to when everything else in your life is changing and, and going crazy and you have amazing opportunities or you have amazing setbacks. The values are the thing that you always come back to to help guide you to make decisions to navigate all of those changes. So yes, kind of a two part for your question, uh, there have been some things like our values, like our mission that has really stayed pretty core to everything that we've done even when everything else, it seems, is changing. Um, so, you know, we really lived out our values, as I said in a couple questions ago. Um, in the early days, I didn't have them clearly defined, but we did that in 2014. Since then, we've really, really w looked to stick to them, and we have not changed any of our company values, not a single letter, since we came out with them. The one change we did make um, is that we originally had our mission statement Instead of saying fountain pens, it said writing instruments because we thought maybe we'll get into roller balls, maybe we'll try and get into some of this other stuff. So we tried to branch out a little bit. And as we did that, we expanded into like Pilot Metropolitan roller balls and Lamy 2000 roller balls and some other things. It didn't do very well and it started to, to, we started to fray a little bit and get a little distracted. So we actually ended up dumping all those, true back to fountain pens specifically. Now, if you're following us recently, the one rollerball pen that we have is the Retro 51. And this one is, of course, one that we don't have in stock right now, but this is the Chipino. Um, but we have our cake and pie. We have, um, you know, some other ones. That's the, the one rollerball brand that we have at the moment. Um, and we do sell some other things like glass pens and brush pens. But really, the focus that we have is for fountain pens. So the, the other non-fountain pen things we carry are still things that the, fountain, the core fountain pen community is looking for and using. So that's still what we true back to. So um, to provide fountain pen enthusiasts with the most personal online shopping experience through comprehensive education, exemplary service, and products we believe in. It used to be to provide writing enthusiasts. So um, it focused us a little bit more. So originally it was writing, we made it fountain pens. That's the one change we have made in the five years uh, since we came up with that. Four, four and a half years since we came up with those values. Um, but we hire by these values, we make our culture and product decisions by them. Um, they're the filter by which we make all decisions. So really like the values are the steadfast pillars that remain constant throughout our company despite everything else that changes. Um, it's not to say that maybe they couldn't ever change, but it would be equivalent to like renovating the foundation on your house. Like yes, technically they could change, but it would be very disruptive and take a lot of time and consideration before we would look to do that. But um, you know, that's really the case for us because the values are not just platitudes. There's something that's really lived out here. Um, and then other things that have stayed the same, you know, obviously we've had some core people here that have been here for a while. Rachel and I have been uh, some constants in here uh, too. There's been other things that aren't like explicitly spelled out in our values, but like, you know, we, we continue to try to innovate and we continue to try to, um, you know, go after opportunities instead of just letting them come to us. You know, that's not explicitly said in our values, but there's things like that, that, that have ended up being kind of true throughout, you know, there's nothing in our values about like we shoot videos all the time, but like videos is a way that's lived out. So the videos have been a really important part and social media and all that, that folds into empower through education for us. But, um, that's some, some things that have, have lived out that way. Um, but yeah, a lot of other things have changed. And then I'm going to get to the last question here. So this is from the Gizmo Hound on Instagram. You've done an awesome job growing a company for 10 years. Nine technically, but that's okay. What does the next 10 years look like? And of course, this is like the question, you know, John just knows because he just went through the interview process. Like, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Everybody hates that question because like, who the heck knows what's going to happen in 10 years? Um, but I still felt like I should take this question anyway, just because maybe I feel guilty after asking it so much in the interview process. Um, so it's funny whenever I get asked this because it's impossible to know what 10 years is going to look like from now. You think like 10 years ago, we weren't into fountain pens. I'd never used a fountain pen in my life 10 years ago. Um, I thought I was gonna be a pen craftsman selling my handmade pens to other retailers and managing maybe a team of other craftsmen making my wooden pens. 
Um, Instagram and Pinterest didn't exist 10 years ago. Facebook didn't have business pages or private groups back then. YouTube had a 10 minute time limit on their videos back then. So if you look at some of the earliest Google Pens videos, I had to split them into multi-parters. Like Q&A in this format right now would be like a seven part video. Like that would be insane, no one would watch that. Um, but now there's unlimited, so I can just keep on blabbing forever. Um, so it's really crazy just to think, I could never have imagined being here where we are today 10 years ago. So in a way, it's kind of weird because if I think about, you know, oh yeah, I have this vision for 10 years from now, it's probably gonna be super wrong and maybe even very limiting from what I could imagine would actually happen. So I don't actually think like 10 years from now all that often. I have like some grandiose kind of ideas there, but um, largely I kind of take it year by year. Um, I have like some like, you know, ideas of maybe what can happen, but it's not 100% spelled out for what it's gonna look like 10 years from now. Um, so I'm just trying to think about like, where am I going to be 10 years from now? Um, my son is gonna be graduating from high school and my daughter is gonna be driving, which totally freaks me out. Um, uh, I love what I do and I really have no plans to stop. Um, you know, and just like, see her 10 years from now, Rachel and I are gonna be 44 years old, um, which is cool, and which is actually kind of fun. That's one of the cool things about having kids young, is uh, my kids are gonna graduate high school and be like adults out there in the world, and I'm gonna be like free and clear to do a bunch of stuff and still be very virile myself. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm really motivated by the challenges of growth. I feel like, you know, I and Rachel both, we really have a unique gift and a passion for building this business specifically uh, and raising up others and leadership and, you know, as hard as that is sometimes uh, to do all that and as stressful as running your own business can be, um, it's really hard to look around at what we have going on here and say, yeah, how, mm -mm, how would I do anything different? This is pretty darn cool. Um, so, you know, some things that I can see us doing for sure. You know, I want to continue to grow. I want to continue to make my own little dent in the pen universe. Um, I want to get deeper into things like product development and branding and the community aspect of the pen world. I can see us having more exclusive and branded products, you know, especially if you look at what we've done in 2018, we've focused a lot more in that. Um, you know, just as we're getting bigger and we're having, you know, more opportunities to work directly with manufacturers to kind of come up with things and have exclusives and stuff like that. A lot of that has to do with just some of the, um, how much we are in touch with you all in the pen community, but also it's just kind of the size company where we're at. We now have the ability to do um, like the size orders that are required for them to do a custom run of something. So it's just, I don't know what happened, I don't know exactly when it happened, but we just kind of reached a point maybe a year and a half to, you know, maybe a year ago where it really started to be in a conversation with a lot of manufacturers to do customs and exclusives. And for me, maybe it's like throwing back to my pen making days, I get to kind of like almost live vicariously through the other manufacturers who've like, they're really good at what they do making, making the physical products, but now I get to kind of like relive that, that aspect of this business that I, I couldn't, almost couldn't make work 10 years ago, now getting to revisit that, but in a new context. So that's been a really fun thing for me to engage and explore. Um, so I can see doing more of that. Um, I can see continuing to kind of lead the industry in terms of like customer service, um, marketing, fulfillment operations. We really take a lot of pride in just the way that we operate as a company um, and how we're respecting the pen community. And I really want to continue to live that out. Um, I'm a little bit concerned, if I gotta be honest, over the state of handwriting over the next 10 years. Um, it's not something I thought a lot about when we first started this company. Um, but, you know, as each year goes by and it's not being taught in school and it gets to the point where even the teachers that are now starting to teach maybe weren't taught these things in school. That's when you're really like, all right, what's gonna happen here? So I do think about that, you know, just the future of uh, the pen, you know, lifestyle if people aren't writing as much stuff down. So, um, you know, it's not something that like keeps me up at night, but I'm definitely thinking about it in my mind. And as we become, you know, in this industry longer and, and are thinking about that more, that's where I become passionate about things like, you know, the, the self-paced handwriting teaching books and all that kind of stuff. So I could see that, I get asked a lot of questions about like, hey, do you guys do any teaching kids handwriting in schools and stuff? And I'll be completely honest with you, I'm like the least qualified person that I should be teaching other people handwriting. <laughs> I'm much more of a businessman and a pen reviewer than like a handwriting professional. Um, but I'm definitely thinking about it and I'm thinking like, okay, people like Michael Saul and Jake Weidman and all that, like I wanna get to know these guys and see what their take is on it and maybe get plugged into that a little bit more. So I don't know where that could go, but it's something I'm thinking about a little bit more. 
Um, you know, I don't know if we're the ones to like lead that charge necessarily, um, but you know, if there will be a resurgence in that area, it's something that's on my mind. Um, and then um, the the way I look at it to kind of summarize the whole thing um, is. I don't actually know what's gonna happen 10 years from now, um, but I view that as an actual benefit because I didn't know where I was gonna be 10 years ago. And if I, if you had asked me 10 years ago where I was gonna be, I would have said, I'm gonna be working a business out of my house, maybe working with one or two other people handcrafting pens, and I'm gonna be like a pen master craftsman. That would have been very limiting in terms of where I feel we are today. So for me, I'm actually excited by the prospect that I don't know exactly what's gonna happen over the next 10 years because knowing who I am and the way that I'm wired, I'm actually gonna seek out opportunities by not having them already defined for me and I'm gonna be dreaming up and accomplishing things that I do not already have in my brain right now. So I think that's really cool and maybe 10 years from now, I'll look back at episode 233 and be like, wow, that Brian had no clue what he was in for. <laughs> which is probably what's going to happen. So uh, there you go. That is my ninth anniversary Q&A. Bit of a doozy, but I just felt like I wanted to take on as much as possible to fit into this one. Uh, the question of the week for this week to wrap it all up, you know, I'm going to flip this back on you a little bit here. So what advice would you give yourself if you were just starting out your career or schooling, depending on where you are in life, knowing what you know now? So going back maybe 10 years or longer if you want, uh, what advice would you give yourself knowing what you know now? And then uh, the writing prompts, this is just for you personally to pick up your pen and actually write something down. I wanna write where you imagine yourself to be in 10 years. Very, you know, existential <laughs> kind of uh, uh, Q&A questions for this week. Um, I didn't, I talked a lot about a lot of products at the beginning, so you can check them out on gulepens.com. Uh, be sure to leave some comments. I'd love to get some feedback from you all about this Q&A. Um, you know, and I'll be thinking about the 10th anniversary as well because I realize that one's a little bit more of a milestone. I feel like this one really just kind of snuck up on me, the nine-year thing. You know, this is like, this video is about the biggest deal we're doing for nine years. Uh, even just as a company, we've been so busy. So uh, I'm going to think more heavily about about year 10. If you have any ideas, let me know what you'd like to see for year 10. Um, but anyway, um, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already. I hope you've really enjoyed this one. I really do. And uh, really honored to be doing what I'm doing. To summarize the entire Q&A, um, all of this is just an absolute dream for me, honestly. Um, I love what I do every day and the people that I do it for and the people that I do it with, they're all amazing. And I just, I, I wake up every day and I kind of pinch myself because I can't imagine uh, being any happier, honestly. So thank you all very much for allowing us to continue doing what we do. We're also very grateful and honored to do it for you all. Hope you have a fantastic week. A couple of weeks, actually, because we'll be off for next week. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving if you happen to be celebrating that in the U.S. Um, and otherwise, I hope you all have a wonderful couple of weeks. Thanks so much for watching and right on.